test. Well, all right, welcome back. Yesterday I introduced that I'm gonna to try to start doing this streaming. exercise again where last time I did a streaming exercise where I programmed in real time through this course material but now I'm trying to level up my skills in R so in order to do that I'm going through Hadley Wickham's advanced R textbook and my hopes really are you know just to move through the material at whatever pace I can manage and you know maybe I'll meet a couple of people who are interested in the same thing along the way but really this streaming framework is just to keep me accountable to to move through the material at least through February so if I like it maybe I'll do it after February but right now I have no hopes behind beyond February All right so I guess the first thing to mention here is that if you don't know R, this isn't the stream for you because I won't be learning really about how to implement R, but learning about how to build some technical knowledge surrounding the, the language itself. So it's interesting, uh, R is one of those languages that gets used to solve problems and it isn't necessarily used as a framework for understanding programming. Um, so when you're taught other languages or people who come to R tend to come to R because they want to get a pr something done and that something that they want to get done tends to be some sort of applied problem. Or at least that's sort of the motivation or the framework that Hadley sort of m motivates the material uh, in the beginning of this book. And, and really, it, it, it makes sense. Like, I learned R because I needed to get something done, right? So, as quickly as apparently as possible. So, I learned R because, as my first programming language, because... I needed to do statistics and I needed to manipulate data and I needed to figure this out quickly in order to get my master's thesis done. And the best way to do that from what I saw online, that was also kind of a practical way to do that was to learn R. And with that, I learned certainly a lot about how to manipulate the, my, I learned a lot of my ways around the language, but I think I, I avoided or missed out on the opportunity to get a deeper appreciation for this this language that I ultimately learned to really enjoy. So we're going back and we're gonna try to enjoy it. And or we're gonna try to gain a more perspective or better appreciation for it. But before I start, I thought I'd just open up our studio and you know, for people who have been privy to using our studio some our users maybe not but most our users I imagine do now I'm just gonna start up a, a new project right here for this advanced R um, um, it's not really a tutorial it's like a learn uh, what's called a learn with me yeah so here I'm just gonna open up a new version of our studio and I'm actually gonna do a, a version controlled version of this so maybe we get a little get out of this too uh, and then we'll call the repo and yes, our learn learn along here we'll call it advanced our learn along Right. Um, uh, 
shoot myself in the foot here. Uh, that's a good place for it, I think, right now. Uh, repository does not exist. Oh, wait. Yeah, let me... I forgot, sometimes you have to do it this way. Oh. Or, this is the E. I found, and I'm not really, I'm not a GitHub expert, but I found this is the best way for creating a repository is just starting from GitHub if you're making a new one. It's going to be a, a public one, so if you guys are interested in seeing some of the material as I go along, um, yeah, it will be here for you, for you to check out. is my repo for advanced R run along challenge dev u dev we'll do we'll call it dev So what I just did there is that I created a, a Git repository for the material that we're going to be making in this advanced R sort of solutions manual. So you guys are going to be able to access this, and I'll, I'll make sure that this is available. And then here is the repository now. So I just made like a simple readme file, and I put it in a space a directory where I knew I'd be able to find it. Alright, um, okay, so now that we got that started, maybe we create a, like a notebook real quick for the material. I really, uh, another thing I really want to do is kind of, let's make a a markdown template so a markdown template would be really cool but right now we'll just do like chapter two material so I don't get any of that stuff that would be really cool and we'll do book chapters. We'll create that in here. And then we'll save this as chapter two. Cool. And book 
chapter, chapter two, so here we are. Alright, so really we're just gonna jump right into some of the material here. Um, and what's really cool about this um, this book down or this this git book that Hadley and his colleagues put together is that it's gonna let me uh, copy paste the code and I'll be able to bring it over into my R Studio and play around with it more. Uh, so I'll have like an interactive sort of experience as we move through some of this code. So that'd be cool. It looks like I'm dropping a lot of frames. Uh, my internet's kind of terrible. I'm gonna have to learn how to deal with that in the future, but for now, really the goal of tonight is just to stream for like 30 minutes or so and do some of this preliminary setup stuff and just practice. Okay. So one of the common things that you do in R a lot is that you declare objects. Um, for example, do this code block and then say I wanted this X here and I wanted to assign or reference some set of values like zero, one, and two. Well, see, what we're doing here is we're creating this, this little, this little guy here, right? So this is the object, right? And this assignment is really just a reference. So it's, it's what's called binding. And that's what the distinction that we're going to be making, or one of the first distinctions we're going to be making up. Um, so when, practically speaking, when you learn R, you learn, okay, I'm going to assign these to this. But what's really happening under the hood is something a little different, or it's, there's a subtlety there that um, needs to be explored more fully. Uh, and so that's sort of the the first set of questions um, or the first set of um, things that the Hadley wants us to talk about. So we're going to learn this distinction between these names and values and we're going to learn how binding or this assignment or how this assignment creates bindings or references. So these x really uh, is a name and these are the values. So when you create values this assignment cr creates a, a binding or reference um, from this name. So x now is referring to these values. So that's kind of different than assigning some object x these values, right? Okay, so Lobster R package is going to let us dig into internal representations. It says that's a prerequisite of the chapter, so I'm just going to make a new code block. Just going to make a new code block up here. I'm just going to install this package. It's going to let us, and then once it's installed, we'll take a look at it. Um, uh, sorry, I should. I guess let's just look at function names here. Uh, it should be like a. Visualize data structures. So this is just going to let us look at data structures. Of course, it's made by the man in the myth, the legend himself. So this it looks like he built this package specifically as a tool so that 
let's see what goes nicely with this book. Anyways, it's kind of interesting. Just build packages for these books. Cool. Well, we'll load it here. And we'll keep reading this. Maybe I can make this a little bigger. Also, let me know. Maybe this a little bigger, too. That might be helpful for people if they were trying to actually <laughs> look at some of this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep moving. So consider this code. It's kind of like the example I was just talking about. So this creates an object with these values, and we're binding the object to this name. So this object doesn't have a name. It's not an assignment to an object. This is just a name. Uh, it's just a reference. So this is um, this sort of di or this sort of graphical diagram is going to be common throughout the text. Uh, and but it, in this particular case, all it's indicating is that we're taking this name in this purple square here. And we're referencing in the memory these values, um, right? And what's interesting about this, and something R does, uh, which is you know, good on R, smart R, is that say I then took this name and I assigned it to another name. Well. R is just going to recognize that this is a name or this assignment is bound to something, bound to some values. And since Y is going to be bound to X, there's no need for us to copy, make a copy of these values. Instead, we can save some memory by just having Y also reference the same set of object or same uh, va uh, same value. It's this same little like bit in the memory. Um, yeah. So this could get tricky, but we can prove this to ourselves through this little piece of code here, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I went, uh, I went ahead and just, I did that already, so I can just assign y then the x, like how we did there. This is the same way. Oops, y the x, and then if I looked, oh look, uh, I print both of these. And you'll notice that they are the same exact value. So what object address does, we can take a look. What it does is it finds the location of an object and memory. So if you call an object address for some reference uh, argument, it's going to give you the name of it in the memory. And you'll notice that both x and y have the same name. So they're referring to the same object in memory rather than two distinct ones. Um, so a cool little thing you can play around with. So another point then um, about names particularly uh, that uh, Hadley wants to point out to us is that there's this notion of s uh, non syntactic names. So syntactic names um, are these names where we have digits or but they can't start oh they must consist of letters, digits, dot, but can't begin with this or a digit. So for example, you can't start the name of something. Well, I want to call it an object, but <laughs> now I'm realizing I don't know if I should call it an object. You can't name something with a digit unless you use what's called a non-syntactic name in, in order to override that because you know you want maximum flexibility you want to do what you want to do in R 
you can use these sort of back ticks. Um, so if you did want to use a non-tactic name, or <laughs> um, you could use back ticks. Non-tactic names are not only these uh, names that would break some of these rules, like starting with a space or a digit, but they're also for very commonly used words within the R programming language. So things like true or if or function. Um, so these are the sorts of terms that you're going to be using in order to manipulate or control the flow of the language. Um, it's the syntax, really. It's like some of the key structures of the syntax. So they don't almost ensure you're not naming things the name of those things, because that could get really confusing, both for the, I imagine, for the c implementing the code, as well as for readers. <laughs> reading the code. So it's probably best not to do that. <laughs> and that sort of makes sense. Well, it does make sense. OK. So we have some set of exercises here. So the first one, then, explain the relationship between A, B, and C in the following code. OK. So we can well, what is the relationship between A, B, and C? Well, let's take a look then. So A here is 1 to 10, which we know is going to be equal to this. So these are the values. This is a value, right? And we're going to bind this value to the name A. And then, just like before in this x versus y case, A is now going to be equal to B. And so if we're binding a name to another name, we know that these names are going to be referring to the same set, the same uh, value object. Uh, and we could ensure that by using some of these uh, lobster r for above. So we could do something like a. I think actually if you do this, if I'm not mistaken, I think I can do this. Uh, oh, that's not going to let me do that. Maybe. Uh, all right. Um, maybe if I do. Uh, This is what I get for trying to be stylish. There we go. So this it gives me one value. So I'm curious what if it's giving me one value because I did this. But still in front of it, I Okay. Let's keep it simple now. So, so it's referring to one. One in the same. One in the same. Or we could do something like this. Oh, sorry, this is wrong language. Uh, right, because this isn't going to. See, that's interesting. Something to be learned here. I just got two extra values. Yeah, but I got the same value here. Hmm. Why? Why does that happen? That's probably above my pay grade right now. But I can get it to address. A different reference value. Anyway, so now B 
is going to refer to C. So we know that if this is the case, then C is going to be equal to um, A and B. Uh, you can see that, yep, so they're all referring to, this, they're all bound to the same value. And now here, D, D is this new set of 1 to 10, but since 1 to 10 is also 1 to 10, I imagine that D is probably just still the same object, right? Why make a new 1 to 10? Oh, so D is not the same object. Um, and you can see that here. So this and this, but this is the same as these. So when we make a new object here, when we make a new set of values and assign it to D, this is a new reference set. Oh, cool. The following code sets as the mean function in multiple ways. Do they all point to the same underlying object? Verify this, okay. So let's see, here's the mean function. This is a base mean function. We can also get the mean function. We can evaluate what mean is. We can match mean. Okay, so all of these are, we've just demonstrated they're all the mean. But interesting, I don't think I need to even use this because I think it says it right here. But I'll, because they're all coming from the same environment, this namespace base. We're going to talk about environments later. I don't think we'll talk about environments today, but they're all from the same namespace. So they're all going to have the same object address. And you can see this object address value here. Uh, lo and behold, same object address value. If I made if I did this programmatically, would the object address value change for i? I know the for loop i and to one, two, three, four, five, we got five. Invalid. Uh, oh, it's in my loop. Call an address, and then we'll print address. Uh, that's pretty enough. Uh, 
all the same. Okay. So basically all we did there was just, I took all the means and I, I put the means with this little mark over here. Uh, I put all the means into a list. So these are different ways we could evaluate means. So this is a different way so we could evaluate means, not mean, and I'm just using this uh, ob uh, object address and I'm running a loop getting the address and I'm printing out each of the addresses. And you can see they're all the same, so this sort of matches our intuition that we got from looking at the, these mean space environments being the same. So they're all, they're all referring to the same method in this particular namespace. They're just different ways of getting at that method. Um, that's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, by default, our, our points in and functions like read CSV will automatically convert non syntactic ones names to syntactic ones. Why might this be problematic? Well, oh no, I didn't mean to do that. We can take a look at read CSV. So we can learn a little bit about read CSV and how it changes values. Syntactic. If true, names and variables in the data frame are checked to ensure they are syntactically valid. If necessary, they are adjusted by make names so that they are and also to ensure that there are no duplicates. Make names, make syntactically valid names. So here, which options allow you to suppress this behavior? So the way to suppress this behavior would be to do turn check names and write space be false. Why we might want to do this? I'm not really sure why that's problematic. In my mind, it would always be good to ensure syntactically correct names. Uh, or is it asking why that particular method, or this automatic conversion of non-syntactic names to syntactic ones? Well, if I don't know, something that happens under the hood without my knowledge is always a sort of a no-no scenario, so maybe that's what it's getting at. I don't know. Okay. Oh, there we go, make names. Okay, what rules does make names use to convert syntactic ones? Okay. So this question uh, kind of gets at make names, which I didn't even notice I was talking about. So make names, you can convert make dot names we can go take a look at make dot names and you can see what make dot names does is a function and what it does it changes the names that get picked out so in the CSV if there were names they're gonna get transformed in the strings 
and then we're gonna recursively use make names and allow those names and if those names yeah I don't know dot and turn <laughs> this this what this, this got tricky really quick okay so in comes a name into the function and it's going to be we're going to make a string of that names and then we're going to take the string that we just made and we're going to run it through make names to make name, names too and we're going to allow allow in this case defaults to true so it's going to be true and unique defaults to false if unique is true then the order of the names cannot be equal to the order of names too so o okay so this ensures that we also don't have duplicates of names and so the names too this internal we're going to make a unique name so we'll make this unique with respect to names two, which is just the name that we took. So then we look at names two. And names two is what we give. So here, a name comes in. We check its uniqueness with respect to other names. And then if it's unique, we choose it, it gets put in the set. If it's not, it's got a it's got a change. We're gonna make it unique. Oh, this is only if we want unique names. But if we don't care and we want some of the names to be the same, I went through this kind of procedure. It's just gonna make the names. I don't know this dot internal means. So call an internal function. Performs a call to an internal function which is built into the R interpreter. Only true R <laughs> wizards should even consider this function. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. This is why <laughs> I don't have jack knowledge about what this function is. It's true R wizards. Talk about day one of Advanced R. It's already referring to wizardry <laughs> and the necessary requirements in order to know. Okay, so a call expression. Mm. I'm not following really still, but it's calling make names from somewhere and it's making them. <laughs> sure enough, I simplified the rules that govern syntactic names. Why is dot? It's not a syntactic name. Well, it's the dot. But let's see, syntactically valid names consistently. No names such as are valid. All invalid characters are translated to dot. When using valid chains of AMA.
names which match our keywords have a dot appended to them. Duplicated values are It's not the dot on the front, it's the val and the numbers, right? That's sort of a trickier question, I'm not really sure about that one. Oh, well, we're getting to the end in here, so this is going to be a nice place to review. So luckily, someone has also done what I've done in the past. Um, and so we're going to be able to get some answers to these questions. So yes, the same objects, same object B points to the, a different object, same values, cool. They did what I did, that's fun. I mean, the list of them, and, but they didn't use a loop, they just checked uniqueness. That's useful. Okay, column names are often data, and making the underlying transformations not invertible, so the data default behavior corrupts data. Okay. A valid name must start with the letter or a dot. It may further contain numbers and underscores. Not, so it's the number. You're not followed by the number. Names that do not start with the letter or a dot will be pre-appended. Names. Name that holds for names that begin with a dot followed by a number. So for the X. Additionally, non-valid characters are replaced by a dot. Hmm. Reserve keywords. Hmm. So there's some cases where we prepend X's, and there are other cases where we we find dots, or we replace with dots, and also pre-append. Start with an X. We always pre-append with X's. Okay, so it's not syntactic name because it starts with one dot, which is followed by a number. So it's a number. Okay. Not bad showing for today. Um, yeah, so that's how we, that's how we're sort of the framework. I hope to do these sorts of things. Next time we'll move on to copy and modify. I'll try to move a little bit faster through the material. I mean, there's no rush, of course. We have a full month, but it would be nice to get to some of the like really our wizardry stuff or magic. This is really cool. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, I'm going to be trying to read this material, too, so <sighs> we'll see where we get. Otherwise, you know, th thanks for listening in tonight. I don't know if I'll be going this long. This will probably be my longest stream, just because it's a little late. But maybe I'll try to stream longer in the weekend. Um, it is currently like a snowed in sort of scenario where I'm from so I don't imagine I'll be going anywhere this weekend so thanks for tuning in and checking out my stream I hope to catch you later where we learn more about uh, copy on modify and keep moving forward through advanced R thanks and have a good night folks or morning depending on where you are, I guess. <laughs>
I just realized my mic doesn't work in the other screen, so I'm just talking to nothing. Anyway, I'll g more Twitch stuff beyond R to learn. And, and so I will be back tomorrow. So I'll use my BRB screen instead of a goodbye since I don't have a, a scene transition for goodbye.